Abraham Kuyper once said, the conflict has always been and will be until the end, Christianity or paganism? The idols or the living God? I am convinced that Kuyper describes our times perfectly. That very conflict is upon us. Throw out whichever of our many conflicts you would like, and you will find at the bottom a decision between two religions, the true religion and the new religion. So it was in Elijah's day. We hear these words in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 17 through 21. You're free to turn there or just listen to them as I read. This passage will serve as a foundation for my message today. When Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is it you, you troubler of Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you have, and your father's house, because you have abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals. Now, therefore, send and gather all Israel to me at Mount Carmel, and the 450 prophets of Baal, and the 400 prophets of Asherah, who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent to all the people of Israel and gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel. And Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people did not answer him a word. This word is for every one of us. It indeed is for the SBC as a whole. You can consider it in scope like Peter's sermon at Pentecost. It is for you and for your children and for all who are far off. And that message is this. Make your decision. If Baal is God, then follow him. But if the Lord is God, then follow him. When it comes to the matter at hand, there is no neutrality. It is not whether, but which. It is not whether you will have a religion, but which religion you will have. It is not whether you will serve a God, but which God you will serve. It is not whether you will obey a law, but which law you will obey. It is not whether you will preach an atonement, but which atonement you will preach. It has been this way from the very beginning. God or idols? Take your pick. In Adam's day, it was the created serpent or the uncreated creator. In Moses' day, it was Canaan's land or Pharaoh's Egypt. In Joshua's day, it was choose this day whom you will serve. In Daniel's day, it was Nebuchadnezzar's golden image or Yahweh. In Mordecai's day, it was bow to Haman or bow to the God who made Haman. In the Apostle John's day, it was, little children, keep yourselves from idols. In Athanasius' day, it was the Son of God or Arius' false God made in man's image. In Augustine's day, it was Manichaeism or the faith once for all delivered to the saints. In Luther's day, it was the false gospel of Rome or the true gospel of God. In Calvin's day, it was salvation by God or salvation by man. In Machen's day, it was Christianity or liberalism. And brothers and sisters, in our day, it is the true religion or the new religion. Make your decision. If Baal is God, then serve him. If the Lord is God, then serve him. What we have seen occur in our culture over the last couple of years is nothing other than the rise of a new religion. Politics is downstream from culture, and culture is downstream from religion. Another way of making the point is to say that culture is religion externalized. Nobody truly privatizes religion, no matter how hard Barack Obama tried to create the freedom of worship rather than the freedom of the full exercise of religion. No one truly privatizes religion. Indeed, religion starts in the heart, but it always expresses itself in a full exercise of its principles, or it dies. So what we have seen occurring in recent days is the simple truth that the adherents of the new religion have been far more zealous about spreading their faith than the adherents of Christianity. What we have observed is not only idols of the heart, those have been festering for some time, 
We have now reached the point where the idolaters have started to offer public sacrifices. The new religion has developed and implemented its ethic. The new faith has begun to proclaim its atonement, appoint its priests, prophets, and kings. I want to consider the identity of this new religion and then various aspects of this new religion so that we can truly understand it and then ask a simple question, which is how long will you go on limping between two opinions? In Eliza's day, it was the religion of Baal. What is it in our day? Identifying the new religion is very important. The new religion is bigger and broader than many think. It has various applications, that is, it manifests itself in various theories and movements, but the religion itself needs to be identified, not merely its social applications and its social theories. In the past, when addressing the LGBTQ movement, I've spoken of the religious root of our sexual perversion. That is, there is a faith commitment down there at the bottom that gives rise to an erroneous sexual ethic up on the surface. And the exact same thing is happening with critical theory, intersectionality, critical race theory, and social justice. There is a religious root to it all, the same religion that fuels the LGBTQ movement. That erroneous religion at the root gives rise to an erroneous theory of justice. So what is the new religion? You could use various names, but I find the best one to be paganism. It is paganism. In 2015, R.C. Sproul explained it well when he said, quote, the culture is not merely post-Christian and post-modern. It has become not only neo-pagan, but neo-barbarian. Ideas have consequences. The ideas of the new age, of our age, have their roots in ancient Gnosticism. That particular philosophy embraced a form of pantheism or monism. God is the one, the sum of everything. All is God, and God is all. That's the system. Monism, pantheism, or paganism. All is God. There is only one, and God is all. Ross Douthat, a Roman Catholic and New York Times contributor, spoke of this paganism in a 2018 Times article called The Return of Paganism. He identifies paganism as the belief that divinity is fundamentally inside the world rather than outside it, that God or the gods or being are ultimately part of nature rather than an external creator, and that meaning and morality and metaphysical experience are to be sought in a fuller communion with the imminent world rather than a leap toward the transcendent. That pantheism or paganism is nothing other than what the Apostle Paul speaks of in Romans 1. They turned from worshiping the Creator to worship the creature. It is pantheism or paganism or creature worship. There is no such thing as a God who is set apart from creation in this new religion. The creator-creature distinction is destroyed. The minister Peter Jones has masterfully explained this paganism as oneism. He basically says it is oneist over against a Christian twoist system. And that oneism, he dates all the way back to secular humanism. You can be a secular humanist denying that there is a God, but still the framework for your world, your worldview is only one. There is only one. All is one, and there is no deity. All is one, and there is no creator. All is one. There is no religion. It's still oneness, and that's been around for quite some time. But then he shows how postmodernism critiques that secular humanism, and both of them die. And in its place is rising this paganism that still holds to the oneist framework. All is one, but now there is a deity. All is one, and now there is spirituality. All is one, and there now is a religion. And he identifies it as oneism. You might consider this epistemologically, how we know things are. Imagine there's a Christian and a secular humanist and a postmodernist in the room. Well, we Christians would look at this brown pulpit and we would say, 
this is a brown pulpit, and it is a brown pulpit because there's a creator who made it a brown pulpit, and he sustains it by the word of his power to be a brown pulpit, and he reveals to us, he has given us a rational faculty, which he also sustains by the word of his power because it's also creature, and we can ascertain that it is a brown pulpit because God reveals to us that it is indeed so. And the secular humanist walks in with us and says, well, we agree with you that it's a brown pulpit. Everybody can see that. It is self-evident that it's a brown pulpit, but I'm not sure about all that other stuff you said about God, about revelation. We don't need any of that stuff. The third postmodernist walks in and says, well, guys, it might be a brown pulpit to you, but to me it's a pink pony. <laughs> and to somebody else, it might be toilet paper. I don't know. We've been living in that world. But now there's a fourth party that's walked in, and it is the pagan. And the pagan says, guys, that is a purple elephant, and you will all acknowledge that it is a purple elephant. Or else off to the gulag. You see? It's not postmodernism. When Nancy Pelosi ripped up Donald Trump's speech in front of everyone, that was the least postmodern thing I'd ever seen. I mean, to each their own, right? No. It is hardening. You will now confess that up is down, that right is left, that good is evil, that that biological male is a her. You will confess it because there is now a God of this system that we're acknowledging, and it is us, it is oneest, it is creature, and you will bow to this revelation. I am hoping and praying that many of our secular humanist friends who would know with us, who are scared about that and say, no, it's a brown pulpit, come on, it's self-evident, don't you? I'm hopeful that a lot of them are going to repent and turn to Yahweh because they're going to say, wait, no, 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 it's a brown pulpit because God said it was. <laughs> That's how we need to be praying for our secular humanist friends. Over against this oneism is the Christian doctrine of God or what Jones uh, advances as twoist. That is, there is a creator and there is a creation and there is distinction between the two. You could represent it by drawing two circles on a chalkboard. The top circle is God distinct from the bottom circle, which is creature. Eter eternality is only in the top circle. There is no creation that is eternal. God is eternal. God is holy. God is set apart from us. He is dependent upon no one. So if you ask us about our metaphysic or if you ask us about reality or existence, we say it's fundamentally two. There is the creator and then there is everything else. And I fear what is happening even in Christian circles. Ever so slightly we are beginning to subjectivize God into the creational system. People might not acknowledge that and hearing the truth they might reject that they're doing so. But this is, this is what's happening and people don't even notice they're creating God in man's image. With this two system, God who is transcendent, set apart, we can understand verses when God says, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Now from a one system, many Christians say, well, I, I know that God is great, but they're considering him as the greatest being in a list of beings. I mean, at the bottom are ants, and then there's humans, and then there's angels, and then there's God, but it's still all one in their framework, in their minds. And so they're saying, I know God's ways are not like my ways. I know that he is greater than me. He's the greatest being in a list of beings. But the point is, he is other than you. He's other, not like us. From this framework, we can understand Scripture when God says, you thought I was altogether like you. We can understand the prophet Isaiah Isaiah 6, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Set apart, set apart, set apart is this God. Without this right understanding of who God is, biblical admonitions begin to lose their force. And so we have been saying for some time now, fear God. And many people are saying, we are fearing God. There's no drift. We are fearing God. But you're, you're fearing God as if He's the greatest being in a list of beings. Angels are greater than me, and, then, and God is the, is the greatest of all, and I do fear Him. But what you need to do is fear God as the one who is set apart, who is not like you. Now fear Him. Or we say, 
take God at His word. And people say, we are taking God at His word. We know God's word is more important than the post mail. We know God's word is more important than what comes across social media. We know God, but they're thinking of God as the greatest being in a list of beings, and therefore that word is still not as full of reverence and awe as it ought to be because that word comes to you from outside of creation. The Creator speaks to the creation. So take God at His Word. Bow in reverence to the God who is and listen to His Word that comes to you. So in many ways, we need to recover some of the way of negation where we describe God by what He is not like, which is hard for our minds because the Bible speaks of what God is like. But anytime you say God is like, you understand you're referencing creation. God is like this. Even God is a consuming fire. I mean, this creation. And yes and amen, He is like that. But we need to learn to appreciate this way of negation. God is not like us. And you say, well, 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 what is he like? You say, well, he's like many things. But take a moment in reverence and awe to worship the God who is not like anything you will find in the bottom circle. This new religion rejects that, and we need to recover this to us idea. I want to consider this new religion in more detail, various aspects of this new religion. We can see that there is a new God, and it's essentially man, and you could say this is essentially that secular humanism that's going on, but the paganism is making the humanism more collectivist human. It's collectivist man now. We've been singing about our own independence, our greatness as an individual for some time. I mean, those are, that, that's been our anthem for decades. But now, we all seem to be in this God thing together, and you will participate or else. Of course, this expresses itself as the state. The state, because this this is all of us together. We're all in this together. As Delta reminded me when they were telling me to put the mask on and to take the measures, because we're all in this together. The grocery stores have been reminding me of that as well. So man is God, collectivist man, and therefore there is a new revelation, a new God, a new revelation. We hear the Latin, vox populi, vox dei, which translated means the voice of the people is the voice of God. We have spoken And so you see theories advancing that are beginning to say, well, these people here don't have a voice. You have a voice, but these people don't have as much of a voice. And sympathetic Christians, we want to hear from people. So we're all, by all means, well, please, like, let's sit down and talk. I want to hear, I want to hear your story. But it's tied to a system that says we all must have the same voice. Why? Vox populi, vox dei. We are God together, and our voice is the very revelation of God. And therefore, there is a new law. Well, what is that law? It's human law. We have been observing the ridiculous advancement of arbitrary laws. And many think you should just obey them. And if you ask why, the answer comes, well, because the state said so. Romans 13. So any sense that there is a divine law over and above Human law is anathema to the new religion. There is no such thing. And so even if you go to the 1689 Confession, you begin to work through um, liberty of conscience issues, you will see language of lawful laws. And you say, well, what is that? In the oneist system, there's no such thing as a lawful law. If the state said it, it's lawful. But there is a higher law. G.K. Chesterton said, if men will not be governed by the Ten Commandments, they shall be governed by the Ten Thousand Commandments. So there's a new God and a new revelation and a new law and a new faith. And you might be able to fill in the blank at this point. It's faith in man. Rod Dreher, in his recent book, Live Not by Lies, identified today's progressivism along these lines. He said, today's progressivism dates back to the 18th century Enlightenment when its more radical continental exponents secularized Christian hope by replacing faith in God with faith in man, particularly science and technology. 
Interestingly, you hear the language of secular humanism there, a faith in science, a faith in technology. What's happening now with this rise of paganism or neo-paganism is, is we're getting rid of the science part. So we're denying science. We're denying the things that are, but we're still putting faith in man. Doesn't matter what the biology says. So it's a mystic or spiritual oneist or pagan paradigm. In this new religion, there's a new structure of the whole world itself. In God's world, we see hierarchy. He's established the world along hierarchical lines. We know Jesus is king of kings. He's at the top. Even in the heavens we see this. There are rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. In Scripture we hear of angels and archangels. And then on earth we see this hierarchical structure as well. There is a head of the home in the state. There are authorities to whom we are to submit. In the church there are leaders to whom we are to submit. But the new religion doesn't want anything of that structure of the world. Now we are to tear down all hierarchy. We're to flatten everything out. And we're also to reject the binary, get rid of that binary. That binary fits the twoist system. We reject that for the oneist system. And so there is Kate Millett, who was a leader in the second wave of feminism in America. She was a homosexual woman, and they would gather at that time with call and response chants in their meetings, and there was one where the leader said, why are we here today? We're here to make cultural revolution. How do we do that? We destroy the family. How do we do that? We destroy the American patriarch. How do we do that? Get rid of monogamy. How do you get rid of monogamy? You advance sexual morality, prostitution, homosexuality, all of those kinds of things. That game plan was exercised, and we now live very much in a time where people reject hierarchy outright and reject the binary. In this new religion, there is a new sacrifice as well. The Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And so you might ask, if we are pagan, then where are all the sacrifice of animals? We don't see that out on the hilltops of our land. And the answer is, that's not where they're offered. They're offered at Planned Parenthood. A human sacrifice. A creature sacrifice for a creature religion. I want my life. This is going to ruin my life. I want my life. So something has to be sacrificed for life eternal in the new religion, which is no eternal life at all. There's a new eschatology in the new religion. We see this in John Lennon's song, Imagine. You see much of the new religion in his song. It's remarkable. It's such a catchy tune. It sticks in our minds. Consider his words. Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us. Above us only sky. What is that? Heaven and hell is the binary. Heaven and hell is twoist. Get rid of that idea. Imagine there's no countries. Again, that's binary. There are no sovereign nations in this system. Imagine no possessions. I wonder if you can, which I always respond that I can't. And if it's true, I think we should be getting royalties on Lennon's song. Imagine all the people sharing all the world. You may say that I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you will join us and the world will live as one. There's the eschatological hope. The world will live as one. If you will simply join us and buy into the oneness system, buy into the pagan system, in the future that glorious utopia is sharing the world and living as one. But how are we going to usher in that eschatological vision? We need a new power. Put your trust in man. Put your trust in princes. Put your trust in human schemes and devices. It is not the Acts 1 8 power of the Spirit of God Himself. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea to the very ends of the earth. It is pure. Put your trust in a human scheme and a human mechanism. And what is that new mechanism? This is where intersectionality and critical theory belong. They are the church growth system 
of the new religion. We will critique society. We will tweak it here. We will raise these people's voices here. We will get at a future eschatological utopia of justice, and we will do so by employing this mechanism. Social justice or critical social justice, as Vody Bauckham has recently described it, and all of its children belong here. And so in many ways, we speak about a, a new religion, and you can throw out anti-racism, you can throw out a lot of different things and say it's a new religion. But I encourage you to think of the paganism that is at the root as the heart, as the biggest, as the new religion itself that gives rise to these other theories that will bring in its false promises. We can see this in the historical development as Jones articulates secular humanism was there, or postmodernism critiqued it, and now paganism is here. And you say, well, a lot of people are noticing it right now, but we're, we're discovering that this new religion has been with us in various forms for quite some time. And we really need to pay attention to that here at this convention where there's so many that are aware now of the stakes, but we're all going to discover, I believe, that we have bought into far more of this thinking than we know. You could go back to the 1960s and consider it covenantally as the Adamic or Noahic administration of this new religion. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. All of the love talk. All of the, all of the Abrahamic promises, you might say, of John Lennon's Imagine there in the 60s. Fast forward to today, what is social justice? And now it's just seems to be taking over our, our conversation publicly. It's the mosaic administration of the new religion. It's the law code of the new religion. And the danger is we might have bought into some of the promises of the new religion and not like the law code of the new religion. We might have begun to syncretize our Christian God with the God of this false religion while not liking the law code. I've said recently to someone, I, I fear that there may be some who want to destroy the law of Baal while actually worshiping Baal. We need to see these connections. R.C. Sproul says, Quote, the cultural revolution of the 1960s was similar to the French Revolution in that its goal was to bring radical change to the forms, structures, values, and ethics of the status quo. It sought to bring in a new age with the dawning of the age of Aquarius. Now the dawn of the new age is long past. Aquarius is now at high noon. He wrote that in 2015. I believe we can even see an impulse, a step toward a Davidic administration of the new religion with what happened with COVID, with what happened with locking up James Coates in Alberta, Canada, with the pressure on Pastor John MacArthur out in California, the state now beginning to enforce the laws of the new religion, this Davidic administration. It's important to see where we are for at least two reasons. First, you may use the wrong weapon on this new religion if you misjudge it. You may think it came out of nowhere and can be put down by the law. I'll meet this pagan law with the Christian law and we'll be set. Or if we can just get the right man elected, we'll be set. No, we won't. This one is driven out by prayer. This one is driven out by repentance and faith. It has been with us for a good while now. And we need that repentance all the way down. We need resolution to stand and fear God and call the godless around us to faith in Yahweh. Listen, they will never leave false notions of justice while worshiping a false god. They need Christ. We need Christ. The second reason we need to see this new religion is that we need to see the breadth of it so that we become to grips with the ways we are being tempted to syncretize with it. So how long will you go on limping between two different opinions? We have a decision to make, and we really are indecisive at this moment. We have a decision to make. We indeed are at a fork in the road. But I don't believe it's a fork in the road about whether we'll deal with sexual abuse or not, and whether we'll deal with the grand sin of racism or not. I think 
that Christians, those represented here, abominate both of those sins. The fork in the road is if Baal is God, serve him. And if the Lord is God, serve him. How are we being tempted? How are we limping? Well, first, we're, we have a decision to make between Christian worship or the worship of the new religion. David Hughes is the pastor of Church by the Glades in Florida in SBC Church. The church's worship has included a seductively dancing woman singing about all eyes being on her in the center of the ring as she cracks a whip and makes it hot. I kid you not. It's live on their YouTube page even now with over 26,000 views. David Hughes, again an SBC pastor, was invited to speak at last year's SBC Pastors Conference selected by SBC leaders. There are worse examples. The same church has one performance in their assembly of a song by a secular artist known as Billie Eilish. She's an American singer-songwriter. Church members perform Eilish's song, Bad Guy, which is too perverse to quote, but includes abusive undertones of blood and bruises and seduction on sickening levels. I've submitted Church by the Glades for investigation and removal from the SBC for not being in agreement with the Baptist Faith and Message 2000. I've not heard back from SBC leadership designated to handle such requests, though it has been months and months and months, and I have followed up. So we're limping between Christian worship in the worship of the new religion. And I fully understand that that's an extreme example, but as you understand the new religion, you will see those same principles at play in our worship throughout the churches of the SBC. A second place our indecision is seen is the choice between Christian ministry or the ministry of the new religion. The new religion's philosophy of ministry is driven by pragmatism rather than God's revealed word. I spoke to a very well-known Southern Baptist leader about Church by the Glades and asked if he would support a humble recommendation to remove them from the Baptist faith and message. Now this leader looked at what happened and said, this is Canaanite. And then proceeded to say, I cannot support it, Jared, because it's never going to happen. They'll never be removed. So I can't support it. That method of operation is pervasive among us. It's not just one person. It's pervasive. We have neglected that there is a God in heaven. We are like Elisha's servant in Dothan who could only see the chariots of Syria surrounding him. But he couldn't see the chariots of fire. We don't believe that there are more with us than are with them. We don't believe that dry bones can live. We don't believe that red seas can part. We don't believe that Jericho walls will fall. We don't believe that the word of God will accomplish the purpose for which he sends it. We don't believe that a corrective word to a church could actually turn them from a pathway of destruction to the pathway of the living God. It'll never happen. So we don't act. We don't speak. We become marketers and managers rather than preachers of truth and grace. The people answered him not a word. Did you hear that in the text? Because you know how the story goes. The fire hasn't fallen yet. The famine's still there. And Ahab's still there with all of his prophets. And they answered him not a word. I'd love to be with you, Elijah, but my board is to the left of me. I'd love to be with you, Elijah, but Ahab's right there and he might take my tax-exempt status. I can't get too far out in front of my church. I have a family to feed. Make your decision. If Baal is God, follow him. If the Lord is God, then follow him. Our indecision can be seen in Christian pastoral parameters for pastoral ministry or 
the parameters of the new religion. Saddleback Church and SBC Church has ordained women to be pastors recently. This is an offshoot of the oneist system of the rejection of the binary. There are other churches in the SBC that have done the same. They've been submitted for investigation and removal. There's no word yet. Our limping can be seen in our hesitancy to decide whether we will be given to Christian confrontation of sin or the confrontation of the new religion. In the SBC, it seems we are tending to deal with private sin publicly and public sin privately. If a public teacher teaches significant error publicly, then the 11th commandment, which is thou shalt not speak any error of a fellow Southern Baptist, is absolutely in play. And if you speak about it, you're a troubler of Israel. But when the error is behind the scenes, then we don't want to deal with it directly with the parties involved, but we opt to publicize the matter. Jesus says, go to your brother when he sins against you, but now we leak letters. There's even a process, if it doesn't go well the first time in Scripture, take one or two others with you, and if that doesn't go well, there's a third step, that is you tell it to the Washington Post. Brothers and sisters, with Paul we say, we refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word, but by open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. God also has a word on third-party investigations. He says, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you know that we are to judge angels? How much more than matters pertaining to this life? So if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? Well, Paul, they're a nationally recognized organization. (laughs) Trained even in the higher standards of Scripture. Paul says, I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle the dispute between the brothers? We're certainly limping over the Christian vision of justice or the new religion's vision, and that's what Resolution 9 signals to us. As I close, consider a simple truth. You have a decision to make, and Baal doesn't send the fire in the rain. Baal can't save. Maybe he's asleep. (laughs) He's too busy. He's going to the bathroom. Your idols are blocks of wood. The new religion is inept. Its promises will fall to the ground, and you wouldn't want them to come to pass anyway. The new religion's Savior himself is but ashes. On the day he dies, his plans perish. And contrary to popular belief, the new religion is the one on the wrong side of history. Because you know how the story goes. God brings the fire. God brings the rain. The prophets of Baal are slaughtered. The same God who sent down fire on the sacrifice has sent down His wrath on the greater sacrifice, His Son, Jesus Christ. The true and better sacrifice. That glorious sacrifice, his name is Jesus Christ. He is the God-man born of the virgin. He is the righteous one who willingly laid down his life on the cross. He died for sinners, adherents even of the new religion, who would turn to him and live. He died and there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. This Christ has risen from the dead. He reconciles sinners to the God who is set apart, the God who is other and not like them. He restores fellowship between creature and creator. The finite and the infinite. The dependent and the one who is dependent on no thing. And this same God who sent down the fire has also sent down the true and better rain. The spirit of the living water. We need no other fountain. We need no other power. We need no other religion. So make your decision. If Baal is God, Follow him. If the Lord is God, follow him.